Hello everyone and welcome to worship. My name is Leslie Shalupny. I'm the Director of Discipleship and Service here at Webster Hills and we are so very glad she could join us online today. Well, last week we started a new worship series called Abundant. It's based on John 10.10, which says, I came to give life with joy and abundance. So what does it mean to approach our faith, our relationships, and everyday life believing that's possible to live as God intends? In week two of Abundant, we will name what brings true joy and explore how we can tap into that source without hesitation. Well, down below, you'll find a link for all of your worship resources. You can download the bulletin, give, and check out all of the events happening at Webster Hills over the summer. If you're our guest today, please take a moment and fill out the Connect card. We'd love to know that you worshiped with us today, and we even have a special gift for you as well. And if you're watching live with us, I invite you to say hello. I'll be there with you as well. Well, have a great day in worship, Webster Hills. Hello friends and welcome to worship. Let's sing together our opening song, a good old hymn of the faith called Rejoice the Lord is King. Let's sing together. Rejoice the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals give thanks and sing and triumph ever. The trump of God shall sound. Rejoice. Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh God, you are the source of our joy and the desire of our hearts. Help us to experience a joy so full that our bones cry out and a joy too sweet that it cannot be postponed. Amen. Good morning, Webster Hills, and welcome to our children's moment. I'm so glad that you are joining us online for this time where we focus in and help kids grow in their faith. So today we continue our series in abundance. So we're learning about abundant joy. So many things bring me joy in this world. Time with my family, my friends, playing volleyball, What brings you joy? I want you to think about that and write that in your journal this week. But also, I want you to spark and bring joy into other people's world. Maybe that's by writing them a note, a mystery one, and just dropping it off and letting them know how much you appreciate them. Maybe it's taking a little treat and giving it to them and saying, hey, you're super sweet. I enjoy you. You bring me joy, but I want you to share the joy of Jesus with each and every person you meet this week. So how are you going to do that? Be creative and share with us how you're going to do that in the comments during the sermon today. Friends, let's pray and ask God to help us bring joy everywhere we go. Holy and loving God, we thank you for all the blessings and the joy you bring into our life. We ask that you help us, lead us, and guide us as we try to give joy to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Anybody with a a love for history or who enjoys that dive into genealogy is thrilled when they come across old letters, whether it's a collection of old letters or just one or two. 
And we don't write as many letters as we once did. And there are those who say that there's much to be lost because of it. Documentary filmmaker Ken Burns, some years ago, he gave us this beautiful example of what all can be discovered about our past and, and the people who came before us when he produced a series on the Civil War for PBS. Now that was over 20 years ago, but it's likely that most of us have heard at least snippets of those letters written between soldiers and their loved ones shared aloud by actors in kind of haunting and yet somehow soothing tones. July the 14th, 1861, Washington, D.C. Dear Sarah, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. And lest I should not be able to write you again, I feel impelled to write a few lines that may fall under your eye when I am no more. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. Letters and diaries give us a glimpse into the past, personal storytelling, told in the way that the writer of the letter wants something to be remembered. It comes from their perspective. Letter writing has a long, long history. And in the day of the Apostle Paul, Bible times, around whom much of our New Testament scriptures are written, letter writing was an art. In fact, in those days, a letter, it carried weight. Now in the church, we rarely read an entire letter from the Apostle or, or one of the people that he influenced in a single setting. Instead, we tend to break it into sections, passages, and we often use it for devotional reading or starting small group discussions or, or to build a sermon around it. And nothing wrong with that. Our practice, though, may sometimes lose the, the full impact of one of those letters. Now, Paul, we remember, was someone who once hated all things associated with Jesus and the new way of religion that had sprung up because of Jesus. He had a change of heart and he became a devoted follower of Christ. And then he was someone who was dedicated to the work of starting new churches, new faith communities. He would, he would come to a city, a place, he would play at a new church, and then he would move on. And it was the moving on that prompted him to write and the reason that his letters carried so much weight. The letters were seen as being nearly the same, very nearly the same as having Paul himself coming back to the church to check on things, maybe to make some corrections, and mostly, though, to offer some encouragement to the congregation. So we know travel was not easy, it was not fast. Now today we might be able to bring the, the presence of somebody important to us into our gathering by using current technology. But of course, in Paul's day, instead of a camera and a satellite connection, they had letters and letters that were carefully written and letters that were intended to be read as part of a worship gathering. So Paul's letter to the church in Philippi was exactly that. He wanted to be with the people in that city. He had a very strong connection to them. And he wrote to them while he was in prison and he named that as the reason that he could not quickly be with them. He reminds them of the time that they were able to be together. He talks about that time so lovingly and he, he shares his frustration about their separation now. And what we have in the letter to the Philippians is an intimate letter, but one that is intended to be shared publicly and not privately. So in this particular letter, Paul had one overriding message, I think, for his friends and for the church in Philippi. And the message was this, be joyful. That word of encouragement, that direction, almost a commandment from Paul, be joyful. And it's evident as he begins to wrap up his letter when he says to the church, be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions, along with giving thanks. And then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in 
Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things, whatever you learned, received, or heard, or saw in us. And the God of peace will be with you. And that was how Paul began to finish up his letter to the Philippian church. Be glad in the Lord always. He repeats himself, just in case you didn't catch it the very first time. Again, I say, be glad. Now, this letter does hold a wide range of messages. There are some words of correction. Some some people are called out by name. They're being told to do more to resolve their differences. And he has some words of warning for them. He's concerned that maybe they find themselves drifting in their faith. He thanks them for the ways that they've provided for him and for the offerings that they've been able to share with others. And he shares his frustration at his circumstances, his circumstances that keep him from being with them. So it's likely that his words landed well in that congregation. Very likely it was a house church, nothing grand or extravagant, but a gathering of people that would fit into someone's home or maybe into a courtyard space. And a church that was very much like a family. People would know each other and and many of them would, would have been there back when Paul first rolled through town, the very first time that he told them about Jesus and and encouraged them to start up and to start meeting together and by that to share meals together and to pray together and study scripture and, and share what they knew about Jesus. And then to do as Paul and the others with him had done, to encourage one another. Now, I will say it might be hard for us to imagine, but this letter would have been very much like a visit from a friend and a mentor, carried weight. So while Paul makes no attempt to hide the troubles in which he's living, he doesn't dwell on them. He's more concerned, it seems, with the spiritual health, the spiritual health of his friends and Philippi, as well as with that church and other churches that he has helped start. So this man who has faced all sorts of trouble and and all sorts of persecution because of his faith and, and his ministry, he shows this young church that it is possible to rejoice, to be glad, even when the situation looks grim. Now, I will say in today's times, you and I might have a hard time really comprehending this. How does a man who's facing this deep, deep trouble, how does this man have the ability to say to anyone that it's not only possible, but essential to rejoice, to be glad in all circumstances? I think as we find our way through the letter and, and toward this instruction toward the very end to turn toward joy always, I think we can uncover the reason that Paul can speak of joy so clearly. And especially when it would have been reasonable for him to just go in the other direction. It's that discovery that holds true for us today. So what Paul does is he comes to the people of the Philippine church and he tells them that the peace of God that is offered to them is not an alternative to their anxiety. He tells them they're not called to do their best to be peaceful because that's what they're supposed to do. He says this isn't about imitating or acting as if they know Christ's peace, says Paul. He wants it to be authentic. And so what is happening in this message of joy and kindness, Paul is reminding them that the peace of Christ is a gift. And it's a gift offered to the people of that day and it remains the same gift for us today. The peace of Christ is a gift to us from God. The Lord is near, Paul says, rejoice. God hears your prayers, rejoice. And when you pray, find peace and rejoice. The peace you find will be complete because it will be God's peace. It will exceed your understanding. And once you accept that gift, what else can you do but rejoice? So we're not gathered here to listen to Paul's letter read aloud from beginning to end. 
we are grabbing hold of a, a small portion of the letter. In fact, the portion of the letter that comes toward the end. And, and we're listening to these instructions to rejoice, to be marked by abundant joy. And I will say, frankly, for some of that, for us, that particular message, it can be a little bit irritating. After all, how can Paul tell us when and how to be joyful? And I don't know all that's going on in everyone's lives, but those of you may, listening may be in a place where having someone tell you to rejoice in the Lord always can just seem wrong or maybe even hurtful. But I don't think Paul is telling himself or anyone else that the right thing to do is to ignore your hurts. He names his. He doesn't dismiss them. What he offers, though, is an invitation to consider all in our lives that is true and honorable and just and pure and pleasing and commendable and worthy of praise. Name it all. Name the pain, name the good, and then rejoice in the good. So John Wesley is the man who gave us the particular way we approach faith in the Methodist Church. He spoke of being so full of God that all our bones cry out and that we can be marked by joy because we have peace with God, we have redemption through Christ's sacrifice, and we have hope of glory yet to be revealed. We can rejoice because God is the joy of our heart and the desire of our soul. That's what John Wesley said. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I will tell you, on a Monday, of course, I found myself in the very early hours of one of those days. And you know what I mean, where the hits just keep on a coming. The day started off with me making a mistake, and I was still carrying some sad news from my family, and then I had a conversation that was hard to process, tough to process, and then a couple of emails just landed hard. I mean, it was only 11 a.m., and Taylor Swift could have written a song about my morning. And finally, I took myself back to our prayer room here at the church. And if you don't know where it is, it's just off the chapel space. If you ever have the chance to be in our building, you should visit it. And it was full on wailing. I prayed. I prayed with full on wailing and it felt so good, so good to tell God all that I was feeling. I felt as if my bones could cry out because I was aware of God's presence. I knew that I was not alone and that the day would pass, that answers would come. And I wish I could tell you that when I left that prayer room, I was absolutely full of joy. I was better, maybe not quite joyful. And it really wasn't until I was driving home later that afternoon, and I was still kind of working through all that had happened. And I don't know why, but just as I turned into the, the subdivision, I suddenly had this sense of peace, a sense of whatever may come, all is not lost, and it never is, a sense that God was very much indeed with me, that the, the problems weren't gone, but my spirit was lifted. The Lord is near, rejoice. God hears your prayers, rejoice. When you find peace, rejoice. Were the troubles of that day gone? No. But that sense of being so overwhelmed by them, that was lifted. And what God offered was exactly what my bones had cried out for, a peace beyond my understanding. Nothing logical about it, but a peace that made rejoicing possible because God is the joy of our heart and the very desire of our soul. Jesus said he came so that we might have abundant life. One of the paths toward living abundantly is to believe that joy is possible. Joy in the good times, joy in the bad, joy that lets us embrace all the good that surrounds us, and joy that lets us boldly face our troubles. Hear Paul's words. Be glad in the Lord always. Again, I say, be glad. Let your gentleness be shown in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and your petitions, along with giving thanks. And then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hello again. It's time for Next Steps, the time to talk about how we can connect and take our next steps in faith together. Well, for this series, we are going to be interactive. 
Each week we will have daily scriptures and questions to ponder about our faith and abundance. So we have a couple of steps for you to take each week during this series. First, make sure to join us for this whole entire series. Come in person, join us online, but make a commitment to be there together in worship. Second, we have a personalized journal for you. If you did not get one last week, text journal to 314-866-4115 and we will get one out to you ASAP. In your journal, you can write daily or weekly about the responses to the questions that are posted each week on Webster with Hills online. Or we do encourage you also to share your responses and chat with one another online. And if you're not a member, you can follow the link below and join us. So our question for you this week to ponder, to journal and discuss is in what ways can you foster greater joy? How will you walk that out this week? We look forward to seeing you online this week and continuing the conversation and have a wonderful week, Webster Hills. Friends, thank you for worshiping with us. I hope that you'll join us in singing our closing song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, hoping to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus, which the morning stars begin. Love divine is reigning o'er us, binding all within its men. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of love. Have a great week.